I'm Maria Menunos, and you're tuned in to AfterBuzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz begin. What's up, AfterBuzzers, and welcome to the Bark Skins After Show. We're talking episodes three, The Sugared Plum, and episodes four, The Law of Two. My name is Carrie Lane. I'm joined by my awesome co-host, Rachel. Say hello. Hey, everyone. I'm really excited to be back. Yes. What do you think of these episodes, Rachel? It's getting very, it was already interesting, but every episode, I feel like we raised the stakes and um, it's just things happened that I kind of expected to happen, which made me happy. But then we also saw some other turns that I'm really excited to talk about. Yeah, it's definitely getting much more interwoven and I was explaining to somebody some stuff on the show and I'm like, okay, wait, I need to pause because there's a lot more going on here and everybody's web is just getting a bit more tangled. So yeah, these were, it's getting even more exciting for sure. Um, what did we think or what do you think? So our first kind of big arc for that first episode, we start with Gomes tracking LaForge and killed by this mystery man. Were you surprised at all with who that mystery man turned out to be? I actually knew who it was. I, oh, like, okay. I kinda, yeah, yeah, you I kind of guessed. Him? Yeah, I did. And it was, um, I mean, I went back, Some I rewatched the first two episodes. So I think it was mm -hmm. fresh in my mind too. But um, yeah, he, I knew immediately who it was. I like that it's dark though, that you're not, if you hadn't seen, or I, I kind of like that I wasn't sure exactly but I like that if you were looking hard you could recognize who it was uh but remember we were kind of debating if he was alive or not too so I was like oh he's still alive yeah and I thought that was a really it made sense based on what um Hugh the man who uh, we saw Lafarge go and you mm -hmm. know literally burned down his tent it made sense that this would be the man attacking him. Absolutely. Um, what was this? It's Hugh. I wrote his name down. I'm like, I'm going to find it. Because um, also, we see him with another character later. But I will find that later. Uh, but yeah, I, I also felt it was very appropriate that he was the one who kills the forge and... Um, is there and kind of makes sense that probably he was actually following him because of wanting revenge. So there's a way to get rid of a bad character. Absolutely. And, but I was surprised that Lafarge got killed off that fast though. Right. I was not expecting that, especially when a star is playing a character, you, you expect mm -hmm. that for production value, it will, that person will at least last a season. No, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, well, I guess. Was we, we've learned then that this is a show where just because you're a well-known name does not mean you'll stick around. Yeah, exactly. Or yeah. just because you played Lupin in Harry Potter does not necessarily yeah. mean you're going to make it through season one. <laughs> right? Yes. So we have Gomes meet with the captain very quickly and talk about, oh, they describe his flesh as putrid, which was like, oof. Yeah, I think if you had a burn then, like, infection would probably be your worst enemy. Oh, it just looked nasty. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can imagine. And I was, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but I was happy to see that uh, Marie was helping him mm -hmm. a little bit. And um, just to, I, I'm excited to talk about her. I won't get too much into her right now, but just to see that he did have some means of relief. Because yeah. that, that is the, um, you know, the absolute worst, one of the worst types of pain you could ever experience. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and cause there's no, you can't just like, you know, you need ointment for it. You can't just go outside or go in the water, you know, like it's still a pain yeah. for him. Uh, then we have, oh, with Yvonne and Gomes and the captain, how much do you trust the captain is actually trying to do his job? I'm not sure because he yeah. strikes me as somebody who will jump to conclusions um, even though, I mean, we see what ends up happening to Cook, but, and we know that Cook was involved in what happened to the settlers, but even so, the captain, I feel like he will just jump on his impulses and he will mm -hmm. make rash decisions before actually 
putting someone through trial. Yeah. No, I, I was definitely like, mm, I don't know if I trust him. Uh, and then actually speaking of Cook, we have Gomes when he goes to question him and has the tea, uh, which was ra- looked rather nice, though, of a, you know, honey and lavender. Yeah. Well, it was interesting because Cook, I feel like when he speaks to most of the people in this village, he speaks down to them because they're not mm-hmm. English. But when we had this scene between Cook and Gomes, it felt like, in a way, Cook was treating Gomes like they were on the same level. And I was like, okay, uh, I can see, like if there's one thing that I feel like the show is really touching on, it's this idea of France versus England and what it meant to be um, a European power in the new world at this time and how you know different parties viewed others. Mm-hmm. Now, why do you think Cook sticks around? I mean, I know he's established his business. So yes, it'd probably be hard to uproot and move somewhere else. But he feels like he has to deal with so much as being an English person there that why not move to a different colony? I think it has to do with his wife. Mm -hmm. I got the impression that um, she was French. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, based on what um, Bouchard said to him that once his wife had passed, he really had no reason to be in New France any longer. So Mm -hmm. I feel like Cook, I... Meeting him the first two episodes, he struck me as, you know, typical Englishman from that time period. But now that we're learning, we, you know, learned more about him. Um, he seemed the, the arc, well, I wouldn't say arc, but the depth that I think we now see with him is that he is someone who um, isn't typical and that he actually, even though you can't trust him, he actually did have reasons for doing the things that he did, even if they were the wrong reasons. Yeah, we get more interesting intrigue on motivations because we learned too. I I guess I was with Gomes of when they learned from Cook that the massacre was Cross's idea. And that then we also get the verification that Gomes was not sent by the company. And he was just going with, to go after his brother-in-law. I guess I, 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 it was that question. I wonder if Gomes just doesn't feel he knows the man that he would be okay with a massacre or if there's more to it. I felt like there was more to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like with Gomes, I trust him, but I feel like oh, there's more to his story than we know. Mm-hmm. I almost wonder if something happened with his sister and Cross Mm. and that there's a deeper reason why Gomes is now trying to find this man. That is a good question. Which we'll probably find out (laughs) as it goes on. I'm sure I'm sure we will. Yeah. But as the show has kind of shown us though, every time we're kind of having inklings, some of those are kind of coming true. But there's just so much going on it's hard to know exactly what's next but we've we've kind of been on the right path yeah absolutely and um one of the things that is such a fascinating aspect of the show is what gomes um what gomes is not telling us Mm -hmm. um i do you know like i like i just like i said earlier i do think that gomes has the the best, he has the best interests of the people in at heart, but there's still more to his story that I think is just going to make him even more compelling of a character once we find out what it is. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Here's my note. Henry Moth, or at least I wrote his name as Moth, the man who um, was the bodyguard. Um, what did you think then at the end when he hangs Lafarge at the gates for everybody to see? Well, it's interesting because we're not made to like Lafarge. So I had no feeling about it. (laughs) What I did have a feeling about is later when we see Gus's wife and when we really start to see his son, Mm -hmm. I feel bad for both of them. I feel bad for the wife. She clearly had, you know, knows what her husband's like, knows the influence that the husband has over the son but there's not much she can do in this time period as a woman. So she really, her hands were tied and cook, you know, paying her off to just kind of let it go and throw the dirt over the body. That was tragic. And also 
you know, in that moment, we're also learning more about Cook and how he pays people off to get away oh, yeah. with what he's going to do. But um, yeah, seeing seeing Gus hang, um, I I knew he was already dead. So it didn't really strike me. Um, maybe it's because we see so much violence in television. It didn't really unnerve me at all. But um, I did feel really bad for his wife and son. Oh, yeah. No, because um, it's like, well, the son, we learn, you know, has been possibly murdered, which we find out he's not. But uh, he, now, you know, has been... T- oh, go ahead. Did you think that Duque was going to let the son go? Or did you think he had killed him? I thought Duque would have killed him. I'm like, no, yeah. Duque, I don't have that much faith in you. I thought that Duque was going to try to kill the son. And the son was actually going to get the knife from him and kill him. Oh, you know. <laughs> or that's try. What- yeah. That's what I thought was going to happen because I did not think 2K was going to overpower that boy. <laughs> no. Uh, well, we have, what was it? The, yeah, we've, we have Cook hiring 2K to kill Tom and that does not go as they plan. Um, which actually speaking about them, Cook meeting 2K at the gravesite and he's like, I'm going to be of service to you was a very interesting like okay yeah definitely Duque is a survived by any means necessary kind of person so I thought that was really interesting um because then he's has the blackmail of oh yeah what did you hide in the shed mm. so I thought that was interesting. it's like mm-hmm. uh oh so the other thing too I want to talk about Gomes that we didn't say just yet is Yvonne with the priest but brother Klepp how he gets taken away by the other priests and they pretty much torture him to get information and are like, Oh, you've seen the devil and are whipping him. Really? And so now I don't know if they're going to get, um, if Gomes and Yvonne are going to get the information they want because he's with the reg- the rest of the priests that they might not let him go or they might kill him in the process. And I almost wonder, yeah, I, I thought that he was going to end up dying. Um, mm-hmm. The father if he doesn't, I just don't know that they're going to be able to get information from him. I think that little Fox is the one they're going to have to rely on. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, actually, speaking of that connection, too, we see Mathilde doing okay. And which I'm glad. I was like, yeah, she's doing great. She's already working, cleaning things up. Uh, but then when she talks to the captain, I like, uh, yeah, it was a business dispute. And that's what left all of this. And it was a wobbly table. <laughs> I was almost comedic and then he's like wow it really is a wobble in that table and that goes back to what you were saying of can we trust the captain Matilda obviously doesn't why wouldn't she say something I mean I'm sure there are a million reasons like you know not just the fact that maybe she doesn't trust him but also she doesn't want to get involved in something that could lead more danger to her Mm -hmm. um, if she starts giving out information Um, there's still people out there who who are involved with this that could hurt her. And if they know that she ratted them out, uh, it, yeah, it's, she's alone now. She doesn't have anyone else to help her. Yeah, I was kind of wondering of the, I noticed she lied and she didn't even mention that Tom stabbed her. She's just like, oh yeah, this happened. I, I think she mainly is doing it to keep um, the girl alive and not, you know, I think she has pity on the boy and Tom and, you know if she was more severely injured she probably would have said something but at this point she's like it's okay (laughs) almost um also with her the i'm trying to see if there's anything more i had um ah yes and she calls her i do like that she has it calls her the little fox as you were saying um so we also got a couple other interesting characters. We got Cell and Trepanier, and they're going to make a sky table. Well, what do you think about that? And what is a sky table in your thoughts? Um, yeah, I wasn't quite sure, to be honest. So I, I think for that, I just want to wait and see what happens. With Trepanier, I was more focused on his behavior in terms mm-hmm. of how um, eccentric, he, even more so, than normal he was acting. And, um, you know, especially once we got to episode four in The Law of Two and just the way that he stormed into the dance and was acting. Um, and I mean, I won't really get there yet if we're not quite at this conversation, but 
Um, yeah, the sky table, I, I don't know. What, what were your thoughts on that? Uh, it sounded like, uh, the, to call it a sky, okay, up in the air, table, I'm like, I guess. It almost sounded like he wanted to make a lookout station, you know, something where you could see a f- farther away, like a fire outpost in the woods where they can see for a longer distance of space. Uh, but I don't know if it's as simple as that. Like he just wants a lookout. Um, we've learned he has very grandiose ideas about stuff. So it might be something more abstract. He I also- hmm. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. He also seems, um, I don't want to say spiritual, but in a way, spiritual, religious, but also like, like he might be into um, some supernatural things um, yep. with the hair. And so I don't know. I almost think with Sky Table, he might, they might be, look, you know, might be something else, like more mystical. Or an altar. Oh, wow. Okay. Or maybe. <laughs> Well, also, I like that when he's talking to Cell, don't tell Marie about him getting the wife. And uh, we also see the Wendette Native Americans and pretty much like, oh, don't worry about them. And that was, and then I don't feel many, you don't just put something in there and there's no importance to it. So I was like, are we going to see them again? Is this a distinction against the Iroquois? Or like, what? It felt like such a odd moment of just seeing these people walk by and be like oh yeah don't don't worry about them like hmm okay Mm, yeah no I think they're going to be back and um yeah because they're yeah I I, like you said I don't think that they ever introduce something especially like that unless it's coming back uh and then yes as we were saying the altar and he mentioned he has that weird kind of creepy altar and prayer and the other lock of hair I was like it was it's definitely more a what? whole bowl of hair right mm-hmm. it was a lot and it felt really like an occult like weird because later he has a conversation with the nun and he says you know it's it's just a different side of the same god but i was like i don't know buddy you're you're definitely in a different direction from everybody else um also he has the moment that i was like oh when he tells marie your cabin as in not here at the manor bye i was like oh. yeah whoa Mm-mm. no i feel yep. i am so concerned about um i don't know like i'm more concerned for marie because mm-hmm. you know clearly we're on her side um it almost it sounds like i mean i really thought that he was with marie in episode me one. too yeah i had no idea that he was looking for a wife and like he went like I, I mean I know that he had this family out in the woods and it was so separate from everyone so I get that that you know degree of separation that could indicate he's hiding her away but mm-hmm. um I don't really understand what Trepigny thought he would accomplish by building up this you know relationship with one person and then deciding oh I'm gonna join the Fee program and actually have a wife. Oh, and I'm not gonna tell the new wife about Marie or my son. I'm just gonna say it's my housekeeper. Okay, that's great. (laughs) He's setting himself up for disaster. I think that's a very good prediction of where that's gonna get going. Yeah, because he also, um, with Marie, um, when she goes while he's gone, uh, she goes to get gets the hair and she takes a, lo- a log, which is interesting, and she goes and buries it. And then there's some kind of uh, little bug that she notices, mealworm something, and takes it, which I feel is symbolic of some of the supernatural that we had said the show is hinting at that I'm like, hmm, I wonder what that's going to do. I thought it went back to the meat when she got that um, oh yeah with the, with the ram when she was mm-hmm. um yeah when she was with Renee I thought that that was her indication um because the same thing with the meat oh Don't like they, it's bad they, yeah mm, I think that's a very good way to think of it like yeah way to a metaphor that's very probably spot on also yeah. how she because she also tells Cell she says he's mad and points and then but he doesn't tell her he doesn't say anything but he kind of has a cell tells marie you know don't put me in this position of i told him i can't tell you 
So yeah, yeah, like mm, yeah. And you know, um, fortunately, she finds out on her own. But <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I liked also. This is one little moment with Duque. I liked that when he was with the village. They said, "Our village is full." Bye. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Because they don't. Like, I can do anything. Yeah, no, poor Duque. And like, it was really funny too. Um, the actress who plays that character, mm-hmm. her name is Gail Maurice, and she like I think what I really appreciated is that she you know, was speaking um, Mm -hmm. the native language so fluently. And then all of a sudden in like perfect English and with no accent says, nope, goodbye. (laughs) We don't want you here. It's full. I thought it was super interesting to see more of the native tribes and this, uh, all the women together. And then her essentially being this authority figure that I was like, Ooh, I like this. Of like, can we get more of them and more information and see them as more main characters, which I'm like, I feel we'll get more from the natives, but maybe not as much as our French characters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, speaking of interesting characters and backstories, what did you think of our nun's backstory, how she was married? Well, so some of this I was, I'm going to talk about for the special segment. I was confused at first because I thought, oh, I thought to be a nun, you could not have been married. Well, apparently that is not true. If you are a widow, even mm. now you are, you're eligible to become a nun. So, um, but just kind of going back to the question about how it felt to learn that, it actually made me have more respect for her because she's a woman who's been married. She's been in the shoes of these other young women who were part mm-hmm. of this program. Maybe not exactly. Maybe she was not, you know, it, actually, it sounds like she didn't even get the chance to choose. Um, she mm. was forced into a marriage she did not want, but she understands what it's like to potentially be forced into something that you don't, you person to be with someone you don't necessarily want to be with. And so I think that that uh, in a, allows her to have more compassion for these young women who are about to oh. enter into matrimony. Yeah, absolutely. Because she was in love with somebody else and then gets this arranged marriage, didn't like it, and then he died. So, yeah. yay. Uh, for her, <laughs> she seemed to be like, well. Um, yeah, but and I, she's, not, she's not dumb. She knows that yeah. even though there is the illusion that these young women can choose, I mean, mm-hmm. look at the people they had to choose from. Like oh, their fathers. Slim <laughs> Pickens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're, you yeah. know, it was, yeah. No, like she knew it was not really a choice. It was more like, okay, well, you can say no, but not really. You have to pick someone. Yeah. Well, I also like with Melisande talking to Delphine of pretty much you can remake yourself here, like thinking of that, which I'm like, okay, maybe. maybe. Yeah, that mixer, speaking of that, was so interesting of, yeah, slim pickings. Either they were old and, you know, not many young eligible bachelors, but I don't know if that's a better thing to pick an old dude because then if he dies, can you get another husband after? Because some time period, I'd say no. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could theoretically remarry, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> right? Or, um, but then, yes. As, and then also, as you were saying earlier, we got Trepanier being all flamboyant with his spices and sugar that I feel we have to remember, be like, that That was hard to come by. It's not like you can just go to the store and get it. I mean, I was a little bit shocked that uh, Melisandre would, a- would actually buy into his lies mm. um, because mm-hmm. she was, I was watching her. And mm-hmm. as soon as Trepanier walked through the door, the, the look in her face, she was, she was studying him. And really paying attention to this man who walked in. And I kind of, you know, like last week when we were talking, I kind of knew that that's where this was headed, is that Trepanier was going to get her um, somehow, one way or another. I didn't realize that it was going to be Melisandre actually picking him and wanting him. And like the way that she seduced him. Um, I was like, oh, so <laughs> this is like, you know, like, you know how they say, oh, yeah. well, go to a person, get like, you know, kind of like, I feel like she did exactly what, uh, you know, 2K20 dating is where yeah. it's like you act like, you know, like a person acts <coughs> like interested and then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, before She's like, they like oh, walk away. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. Oh, we'll see what happens. We'll see after you've had a drink from 
all the other cups. Somebody else. Well, I like the Delphine's not having it at all, but I think Millison maybe um, notices and appreciates his ambition. Even if he's kooky, he still has a drive, and that kind of I think aligns with her wanting more and like expansion, I suppose. But yeah, I guess. Um, yeah. I think that's it for that episode. So now we'll pop over into episode four, The Law of Two. And speaking of our pairs pairing up, that leads us into episode two. Um, and then, yeah, we have mentioned Lafarge at the funeral, Mrs. Lafarge and Paid by Cook, which I'm like, hmm. So Law of Two, we have Trepanier talking with the little school children and everything. And I mean, he's kind of right, you know, sun and moon. Uh for couples and you know but i like that the nun was not having it either because she's like uh we do not share the same god stop talking to these kids yeah and it was um i mean to me it's like regardless of what religion trepanier belongs to i would Mm -hmm. not want him teaching children (laughs) right like Like, i don't i don't care what his religious beliefs are just him as a person yeah I'd be a little suspect too yeah, yeah 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 um and that's another thing I'll talk a little bit during the special segment about what cathar catharism actually is and how and why I don't know that the nun was really just I don't think it was just his religion I think it was just mm. who he is as a person mm. and who and how the fact I mean I think the nun understood one that he already had a child I'm pretty mm. sure she somehow knew this um and then she might have knew she might know about Marie maybe um but then on top of that um so like there's that in terms of being ungodly but then also just the fact the nun probably knew that he was lying about um being a wealthy man oh boastful and everything I mean he has a bit of wealth and he has a bit of property but I do feel we've it's been pointed out that that's in question how much he really has control of it um, and, and then we were talking, oh. Mm-hmm. Well, and how much debt he owes. Like for instance, the yeah. house, the innkeeper. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I, I feel like he might he might be in major debt with many people. Hmm. I think you're onto something with that one. Well, on Melisande though, she points out like men put on a show as did we, and they've made their choices. But I like that the nun warns her about him. And it's like, hey, you know, worry about that um and speaking of that so yeah they get to speaking of trepanier and all them them together and then i the pay the bill um where to go ah so what did you think then when trepanier bumps back into decay with cook of like oh he's a rat <laughs> he's all yours i don't want him he is a rat as he said <laughs> Yes. Uh, it made sense. I mean, I think that Trepanier, he's just, he strikes me as one of those, you know, type of people who, um, when he, when he's really happy, he will let, obviously let certain things go. Mm. And so right now Trepanier is on a high. He has his wife. He is officially, well, almost officially married anyway. And so, you know, he, what use is this Duque guy going to do for him now that he's already run off? He's just going to run off again. So mm-hmm. I think that Trepanier actually made the right choice by just not even, you know, not even causing a, a big deal, not even making a big deal about it, just cutting him off and saying, goodbye, he's yours, see you later. Yeah. He realized he's like, this is not worth the trouble. I don't want to bother with it, which I think he probably made the right choice. Uh, when they're walking through the woods so far back, I was like, man, I bet most son, this is not exactly what she planned because he lives out in the boonies. He is not well, that close to town. And when he was like, oh, the snakes and the rats and the hawks and just listing all these things. I mean, this is, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, like I, I did not. I don't think that she was expecting him to be um, in this area at all. Yeah. Also, when they get to the house and everything, and she sees Marie, and then Trepanier is shutting the door on her, I was like, oh, oh. And when they're talking, how um, Melisande says, well, you should put her in her place. And you're, we're going, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> because Trepanier probably will. Yeah. And, and like, also, 
I feel like, I mean, we've seen how Melisandre can be. She mm-hmm. will try to put Marie in her place, yeah. even though we know Marie and we're on her side because we've seen yeah. her perspective. From Melisandre's perspective, she doesn't necessarily know that Marie and Trapanye were actually together. So mm-hmm. she's probably just assuming, oh, well, this housekeeper is going to try to step in and take my new husband. Oh, no, this is not mm-hmm. happening. And we know that Melisandre has such like um, like a dominant attitude. She's not going to take crap. Like She's going to step in. Oh, well, also her against Trapanye. I'm really curious to see how that unfolds because she's not what he expected either because she... Like she's been the chatterbox on the road, which felt a little weird for her because she does talk a lot, but that felt like she's just rambling. Yeah. But she does not easily get pushed aside on anything. And I'm waiting for him to be like, all right, woman, do these things. And she'll be like, no. <laughs> you do these things. <laughs> yeah. So well, I'm waiting. I'll, that'll be entertaining. I almost think that like if Trepanier did resort to physical violence, that she would actually outwit him and out, mm. um, she would just be stronger than him. Mm. <laughs> she would turn she around and be like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, she would be cunning. There we go. Yeah, cunning. oh, absolutely. Uh, so we also learn the, oh, we have an, another, speaking of all our A's last names, we have Deske. When he's flirting with Matilde, I kind of thought he meant well. Like, he's pushy, but then we learn he's been a bit handsy with her. But even later when he's drunk and she slaps him, he does apologize. I mean, it doesn't mm-hmm. excuse his behavior, but I don't feel he's all malicious intent. Like, I think he does like her and maybe does want to be with her. Yeah, I was really worried he was going to try to rape her. Um, mm-hmm. until, oh, yeah. And I was very surprised when he said sorry and walked away very Mm -hmm. I did not expect that it almost seemed like a very like you know just completely 180 degree turnaround I was like okay what no because I mean I'm glad that he did and said sorry and walked away but I this scene seemed to be going in another direction Mm -hmm. and I thought that little fox was gonna run out and kill him that's where I thought this was going well, she kind of does. Uh, <laughs> later. Which, yeah, the poor, I, I almost felt bad but for him where she kills him at the, well, she we assume him. We do yeah. not know he's dead yet. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I thought Matilde, like, you know, he was not going about the right way, but was like, hey, you're single now. <laughs> but we learned she can hand herself just fine and even with little fox says us girls will make do and you know learns that her husband did not keep the books well and yeah half the town dined on credit which i'm glad she's fixing that fast um so then this also uh when the captain coming over and he's like okay keep an eye out and then she reveals all the connections going on and points out like you should get rid of cook which she seemed to be kind of staying on the outside of these things. So it's interesting. She got really in it. It was like, Captain, no, this is what's going on. And I like how he said, oh, you didn't mention this before. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't really understand. The fact that she eventually did speak up about all everything going mm-hmm. on. Um, I, I mean, I guess I understand why she waited, but. The thing, the only thing that's really going through my head is that she just at first, you know, was in a lot of shock about what had happened too, and mm. didn't necessarily know if it was the right move to talk about it. So that too. Yeah. Well, she's also, I like how well the inn seemed to be doing. It was packed with people, you know, she was busy. So she definitely does not seem to be struggling at this point. Um, so our other characters that we haven't really talked about too much yet is one, they're quite at the beginning collecting their dead and getting that priest which I thought they had killed him so I was a little surprised when we find him later and he's alive where did you think he was dead yeah I thought he was dead yeah completely yeah I did not think he would have survived that and then Cell spots them and gets shot by an arrow and then gets away almost but then gets captured again so I I feel there's going to be more there too 
I don't want to get too prediction-y with that, but mm. I think that, I mean, first of all, the Iroqu Iroquois were seeing, just like Yvonne predicted, they were seeing their own men, their own yeah. people hung up. Yeah, of mm. course they were going to have a visceral reaction to this. So the yeah. fact that, um, I, I don't think that it's going to, I don't think that Renee is going to have a problem. I think that um, it's going to be okay for him, but yeah. um, of course they're, the Iroquois are upset right now i thought marie might show up and even i don't think she's of that group but she could still be like yeah something i don't know um i think she so, yeah. might we have the we have gomes and yvonne in quebec city which we talked about on our special segment a little bit ago uh, i was then, really happy to see that yeah <laughs> Then they, I, I thought it was almost funny though that they were getting scolded for using company resources and how kind of disturbing, but surprised, oh, disappointed, but not surprised how they talked about, oh, well, are the settlers cleared? And it's, and how Gomes points out, no, is like a massacre. And how that the person they're talking to says, you know, one will find allies where needed and particulars are not important. Whew, you're like, but you like massacred some settlers to take over land? What? Yeah, the whole thing was, I did not know how to take that guy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I get it. They're trying to show how complicated it was back then in history and um, how like ultimately at the end of the day, all he really cared about was basically um, enabling the uh native the englishman mm -hmm. to overthrow the french and that was that's the goal and the fact that they would i don't really see gomes as being part of this i mean he mm -hmm. is english but i don't necessarily think that he is like most englishmen and that he wants to overthrow the french and get new france and you know take it over i don't see him being like that obviously yvonne i don't see him being like that um so I feel like, I mean, now that they've been given this task of going back, and I mean, they I knew that they were going, that Gomes had to have a reason to go back, so I'm not surprised. But now that he's been given this task of basically um, working around that village and, you know, just kind of sticking around there, um, I, I don't know, like, what, I feel like Cross might already be dead. Hmm. That's a good point. I think yeah. just a prediction of do we think crosses are alive or not? We'll hold that in our prediction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so our other little bit too is Duquet, when he watches Cook get arrested, uh, takes some money, but doesn't run, gives it to, gives some money to Tom and is like, dude, leave. Also that Mathilde gave um, Melisande money too. I thought that was interesting. And mm -hmm. Also, with Cook sitting with Duque at the end, and then he goes, I see what kind of man you are. I thought that was interesting that, um, okay, Duque, show loyalty, because he easily could have taken all that money and been out and leave. I don't think it's loyalty. I think that mm. Duque really is a rat, and I think that what he understands now um, is that if he runs, he's going to have to keep running. And so he's decided... Um, I saw the wheels kind of turning in his head as mm. Cook said, when they were, this is before Cook was, um, you know, taken yeah. to sit in front of the village and just kind of, yeah. you know, before they took him, um, when they were just kind of walking through the market and Cook literally said, um, you're not going to oh, see me making, money. yeah, you're not going to see me making the goods, but I, my hand is in everything. I'm always mm. trading the goods. And so I think that when Cook said that to Duque, Duque realized that's what I need to do. I need to become this cook guy. I need to watch him and learn his ways and then eventually work my way up and become the next cook. And so that's what I think Duque's goal is. I don't think he cares okay. about du about cook. Um, I think that if this had been before that conversation, Duque would have taken the money and ran. But mm. now um, he's like, no, there's I, I can see myself doing really well here. I'm going to work my way to the top. Hmm. That's and so that's point. why he needed Tom to leave. Yeah. And also, I I don't quite think Duque is a murderer now, but, you know, and I think anybody, it's hard to kill a child. So yeah, we shall see. 
All right. So the only other big thing that happened in this was Delphine with her husband. And, you know, at first it seemed like respectful enough and he steps out so she can change in her nightgown. I'm like, okay, maybe this isn't going to be awful first night of marriage. But then, you know, she gets away. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe he's giving her a little of the space. No, nope. then he's like, okay, take off your, your gown. And something's wrong. Yeah. So what do you think is wrong? So it's interesting because before she took off the nightgown, I was getting the sense from her facial expressions that what was wrong is that she felt really uncomfortable sleeping with this man. And Mm -hmm. that could still be part of it. But now, like after we have that reveal of, you know, whatever was wrong, initially I thought, wait, is she pregnant? Is that what's happening? And the reason maybe it was missed by the by mother sabrine somehow i don't know how long Mm. yeah i don't know how long they've been with her um like how much time has passed but right theoretically she was really early on when she got there and mother sabrine did the test and somehow didn't realize that well one we don't know we know how mother sabrine was um with melisange and she said oh well i've seen that you've had sex here is some blood Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mother Sabrine could have been like that with anyone else. And so we don't know if she was like that with Delphine or not, if that's what it means that Delphine has had sex, but that she didn't look pregnant at the time. And so Mm -hmm. uh, Mother Sabrine just let it go. Um, But that's, that's what I'm guessing that it's a pregnancy. I thought pregnancy too, because they did a, you know, body inspection. So I would think if there was any sort of issue scar birthmark i don't know whatever i'm just like does she not have like a boob or something (laughs) like i just went what what could be wrong but if they were inspected by the nuns like you would think everything is intact and normal but then that makes sense that she was just so early in her pregnancy but it's interesting he didn't go into like a rage like oh you whore he just was immediately oh well all right you go over there and like it was his behavior was weird too so i i hope we get that reveal which I, we probably will for the next episode but it, it was I, definitely weird i think what they were trying to show with him is that he was an average man in that time period in that okay he obviously just like trapanier he had to apply for this program. He was accepted. He has a wife. This wife, you know, I, I'm not 100% of the law at the time, but I'm assuming this wife is now his property, um, even mm. if it hasn't officially gone through. And so in his mind, okay, I have just, I have a wife, uh, her, the husband, and, and her matrimony and what that, imp- what that entails, my wife is supposed to have sex with me, period. That's just probably the way that his mind was and just his, you know, contemporary thought of that time period. And so when he found out she was pregnant, um, that's, you know, he, that was probably like for that time period, a very calm way of just telling, you know, of just kind of like pushing that person away Um, Mm. instead of sleeping with them but I'm wondering what this means for the future because they Trepanier kept saying well we're not officially married yet when he was talking about Melisande yeah but I'm just wondering if they've already signed the legal work in terms of the village I think they did when they when they're leaving the matrimony thing um so Trepanier probably met in the eyes of God then Mm, yeah in terms of in terms of how his religious beliefs yeah um, so we're shortish on time, so let's do our quick special segment before we do our predictions. So yeah. Rachel is our history expert, so look, take it away. Awesome. So I'm just going to do a really like lightning fast uh, segment. Um, I, you know, I already mentioned part of it, and that is about the nunnery and how you can be widowed uh, and become a nun. The other thing I wanted to briefly talk about is um, what um, Kuthars actually believe in. Um, So I'm just going to list like three. Um, They believe the recognition of the feminine principle in the divine, which means that God was both male and female, um, and that the female aspect of God was Sophia, meaning wisdom. 
Um, mm. And so I could see like just right off the bat how this could be a problem for some other religions of the time period. Um, they also believed in reincarnation, um, which uh, I, yeah, I can tell you just from growing up Catholic that that is not something that Catholics are taught. Um, and so I could see that being another problem. <laughs> and uh, they also believe that there, this idea of cosmic duality, um, mm. kind of going off of the male and female God, um, the existence of two powerful deities in the universe, one good and one evil. So a little bit different from male and female, but um, but these two, uh, these two, this duality was always in a constant state of war. Um, yeah. So that's just listing some of them. Uh, next week, I'll do more. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll dive in a little bit deeper. But. Nice. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah it's fun to hear some of the history of it as well. All right, so let's get into some predictions. What's the prediction? Uh, we've kind of been saying them a little bit along the way, uh, but what are some predictions that are jumping out for you? Well, I'm partially saying this because of the book, and I said this a couple episodes ago, but uh, Renee and Marie, <laughs> definitely them getting together is a prediction of mine. Um, mm -hmm. With uh, Melisandre and Trepanier, I think that um, Trepanier is going to try to show dominance with Melisandre, but then she is going to prove that she is always, she's always going to outwit him. And so I think that they're going to start to have some major problems, but mm. um, I also think that uh, my guess is that Melisandre also, Melisandre can't have children um, and that she won't be able to give him a child. And so here he is with a mistress, for lack of a better word, who has given him a child, um, but she will not be able to. That's another prediction. Um, and then just the last one, um, I think that Renee will escape the Iroquois because they will let him go. I agree with those. I, I do think the, even though they seem almost an ill-fitted match, Melisande and Trepanier, I feel they almost are kind of a good opposite pair. Like they are kind of fitted for each other. Then I'm like, well, we'll see. Uh, I think that... I do think Little Fox killed Deske. Uh, I, I'm curious how Matilda will find out, and her reaction, I think, will be of shock, but she will still support the girl, so she'll be okay with that. Gomes and Yvonne coming back into town in a more official capacity, I think, will just cause a little bit more problems. Uh, I don't think Cook's gone just yet, but I'm curious on how they'll resolve that because, you know, he's not pleading to guilt for it. He's just, you know, oh, it wasn't my hands, it's the others. So we'll see. Uh, I'm wondering if our burn victim will come forward and talk about that as well. Of like, hey, I was hired because he would be a great witness of this is what happened. So we'll see. I'm curious to see what the next two episodes will hold for us. All right, so that wraps up our after show covering those two episodes. Uh, Rachel, where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter at Rach Goodman or on my author Instagram account at Rachel Radner Author. And my name is Carrie Lane. You can find me online at Carrie D. Lane uh, on Twitter. And also make sure to stay tuned. We have footage from the junket for Bark Skins with some of the cast. So that's at the end of this video. So Stay tuned. Don't click, click away yet. You'll want to check those out. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. Hi, Elena Jordan here with After Buzz TV. So excited to be sitting down with Zon McLaren and, and, and Iron Bernard, uh, who are both going to be in this incredible new series from National Geographic, Barskins. Can you guys tell me a little bit about your characters and how they interact? Because I know uh, that your characters on Yvonne and, uh, and Iron, your character Hamish, both work for the, the Hudson Bay Company, but are very different characters. So can you kind of elaborate on that? Zod? Me or you? We are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um... Yeah, I mean, Yvonne is a company man for Hudson Bay Company. He's very dedicated to the company, and um, he's a learned Indian who went to to school and and, and loves literature and, and poetry. And he becomes uh, connected to this character 
uh, Hamish Gomes through uh, Hamish saves Yvonne's life and Yvonne feels an obligation to repay that debt to him and uh, he becomes they become friends they become uh, uh, partners and in, in, um, in the pursuit of of the goals for the Hudson Bay Company. He's half uh, Ojibwe and half Caucasian. And instead of following his people's ways, I think that he ended up going the opposite direction and becoming, going to school and, and uh, dressing like an Englishman and uh, embracing that side of his, his ethnicity. And now, Nair, I know that your character too, Hamish, is kind of this clean cut guy and he also kind of ties into more of the the mystery aspect of the series which he's looking for his his comrade who's gone missing can you kind of talk about uh your character and about kind of that aspect of the the series as well yeah well uh, hamish is kind of he, he seems like this clean cut guy who's kind of checking the boxes the lists of the company and everything is kind of I guess, um, well thought through and predictable. But underneath it all, he has a great secret, which is he's covering up why he's really there. You have to remember that, well, what I'm not saying you have to remember, but I had to remember whilst doing it, is that behind it all is that this man was trained by one of the best military services of its time. Um, he, he was he was trained with you know the Imperial Navy at the time. Um, he was trained on the Orkney Islands, which was also where a lot of the um, Hudson Bay Company officers, soldiers, all the rest of that were put into an academy. And um, it's not the SAS situation. And I think he was just a bit OCD. He needed everything to run the way it needed to officially because he needed to sign off on everything to make sure that he wasn't doing wrong. And I think there's, um, even though he's incredibly quick and knowledgeable, I think there's a naivety that he discovers about himself during the process of this, which could make him even more dangerous or could make him a bigger ally. At a different moment, so he's capable to play the play the jigsaw puzzle very well, and that's why the mystery you get is Amish Gomes. Now, did either of you read the the novel prior to filming, uh, or did you want to go in just with with Elwood Reed's interpretation completely fresh? I, st I started off um, reading the novel. Um, I got halfway through it and then I started getting scripts um, and realized I should probably just stick with Elwood Reed's version of the story. Um, obviously, the book is quite broad compared to, to Elwood's. Basically, Elwood's stories only cover the, uh, the first hundred pages, I'd say, of, of the book. Um, yeah, I ended up sticking with the book. It's quite different. Plus, there was no Yvonne in the book that I came across anyway. And I got half, I got probably 400 pages into the book. So not as good. <laughs> uh, it did. It, well, you can't really compare the two. One is very, very general and expands, spans over 300 years. And the other are more of a microcosm of within that book of these characters. I have to say though, Zahn, too, I was partially so excited about this series when I saw your name attached to it because for After Buzz, I also covered the Westworld After Show and one of the most beautiful episodes of any show I've seen on television was the Akachita Backstory episode, just absolutely gorgeous performance. How do you approach a character like this versus a character like on Westworld because they are so different? Well, that's the thing. They're completely different. First off, Westworld was... A, uh, a show where you didn't actually know what was, you didn't get any scripts. It's kind of told to you the day before or actually the day of shooting. Okay, this is what your character's doing right now. So um, the approach is completely different. It's more of just showing up and uh, 
uh, being honest, hit your mark and, and, and get, have an idea in your head and try to be honest with your work. And <clears throat> with Yvonne, it's, um, you have the wardrobe and um, you have the setting of being out in the woods and you have the scripts available and you're interacting with another actor, a phenomenal actor named Aniron. And that camaraderie and that relationship um, is important as well, bringing different things to Yvonne. Just completely different uh, projects and completely different um, styles of, of getting into your character. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for sitting down and speaking with us. This was absolutely phenomenal, and we cannot wait to check out the series, Barkskins on National Geographic. Thank you. Thank you. Founder Kevin Undergaro and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to After Buzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> the views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.